I'm John Buchanan, and in this episode, what we're going to do is to look at the third part in our orchestral programming series. Or is it actually part zero? Now then, in episode one, what we did was to write a first violin string line and to think about how we were going to shape that using MIDI controllers. What we did in episode two was to kind of flesh that out into a kind of full string arrangement for five separate string voices. And what we're going to do now in episode three is to not move that piece on at all, but instead to think about an orchestral template. So effectively, this kind of could be the very first thing that you do before writing your first violin line. Too late. Or it could be something to consider now before we take on our piece any further. So on this channel already, I've made a video about building templates. The idea that what we can do is to configure a set of tracks and what they allow us to do then is to open a project with a sort of collection of sounds that we like to work with already pre-configured, which saves us a few minutes of setting up, let's say, a few audio tracks or a few piano parts or whatever it is that we like to write for. But if you're someone who wants to compose for TV or film or you want to write trailer music or in fact you're writing any music which requires a lot of orchestral sounds all lined up perhaps alongside some synthesizers and some drums and some audio tracks, working with a deeper template is going to be a massive time saver for you. Think about it this way, if every time you started a piece of music you had to set up all of your violins and all of your woodwinds and all of your brass and all of your percussion and all of your synths and all of your everything else that you wanted to write for, it would take you two hours to just build the sounds that you wanted to use despite the fact that you used them yesterday and you want to use them again tomorrow. It's much better to have an orchestral template set up, ready for you to just go to work and be creative. So what we're going to do within this video is to build an orchestral template. Now, you'll probably have noticed that on this channel, as the content has come together, Will has configured a wonderful collection of playlists for us so that you can go and find classic production techniques. This could go on a playlist called the Bedtime Stories Hour, where I'm going to talk a lot and you're going to try really hard to stay awake. Okay, and if that doesn't work, then enjoy your dreams. What we're going to do is to start completely from scratch with a software instrument which isn't assigned to any individual track whatsoever. The instruments are going to come later. What I'm going to do is to build one software instrument and there it is, there's our template, all sorted. Thanks for watching. Okay, I joke. Now, what am I actually going to call this track? Now then, if we were writing traditional orchestral music and we were interested in making sure that the way that our template was built mirrored the way that scores are produced, we would start with the woodwinds because they come at the top of the stave or um, a full score if you're writing for orchestral music. But what I would definitely say is that I wouldn't worry about that so much. I would say start with the tracks that you write for the most. If you're someone who writes for the piano and what you then want to do or writes on the piano, I should say, and then what you want to do is to take your pieces and kind of transmute them across to the orchestral instruments you want to write for, then I would make your top track a piano track if I were you. But you can do this however you like. What I'm actually going to do is to start like that with one piano track at the top. And in fact, really what I want to do is to make sure that I've got a few separate tracks here which are going to relate to keyboard instruments. So this is the really important thing to say, is that every time I double click to create a new track, what I've got a chance to do is to build whatever sounds I like. And it could be that sometimes I like to write for a Logic piano, and maybe the next day I like to write for a piano from my favourite third party library, and then on the third day I like to write for another kind of softer piano perhaps, in which case what I want to do is to have at least three piano tracks within my first part of my template. And what we're going to do is we're also going to learn that there is a value, a huge value, to having another track which we're going to call Piano Duplicate. Except that I haven't spelt that properly and it matters because otherwise I'm going to look at that the whole way through with a double P. There isn't a double P in duplicate. So there we are, I've, I've created a deliberately a track which is going to be called Duplicate. We're going to see why that's valuable in just a little while. Okay. Now then, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to put all of these tracks into a track stack. Now what that allows me to do, of course, is to sort of subgroup these into a summing stack, which basically means that all of those sounds are going to get rooted to a particular auxiliary. So I'm going to see that this piano is now being sent to bus one, and so is this one, and so is this one, and so is this one. They're all being sent to bus one, and we're going to call sum one keys. 
Okay, so effectively that is my keyboard stack. And it doesn't matter that I haven't assigned instruments to those tracks. We'll come back to that in a little while. I'm gonna close that stack down so it doesn't become confusing. And what I'm then gonna do is to create a new track. Now, of course, that's gonna be instrument five, not instrument two. Remember, instrument two is one of the pianos and it's in the key stack. So every time I double click, I'm getting a new instrument. And this, I'm going to make violin one. And then what I'm gonna do is to make violin two. This is where the eyes start to get sleepy and we're just falling gently into a somnambulant state. Let's call that double basses. I'm back. Okay, there we are. So these are going to be our violins. Now then, I need to be a little bit careful. How deep do I want my template to go? Do I want, for example, to think at this moment about how I like to write for orchestral strings? What do I mean by that? Okay, well, it could be that what I would like to do is to say, okay, I'm going to just write for one string ensemble. In other words, whenever I write for strings, I want all of those strings to just be folded down into one group, which we could call strings. But what I might also choose to do would be to say, okay, I'm actually going to create a folder for just long string sounds, and I'm gonna create a separate track stack for short string sounds, because maybe those sounds are gonna have different reverb requirements, they're gonna have different tone requirements, and I could potentially separate them. It also gives me the opportunity to write for long strings and short strings at the same time if I'm writing the sort of music where I'm trying to maybe have loads of extra power, potentially useful for trailer music, for instance. So instead of just calling this strings, what I'm actually going to do is to create two lots of these. So I'm gonna duplicate this, which is gonna keep this um, as violin one, but I'm gonna call this long. It would help if I got my timing. Uh, my typing right, and I'm going to call this one short. I'm also going to duplicate this one here, and this is going to be violin too long, and this one is going to be short. You can see what's going to happen. Yep, more of the same. So this one is at my viola long, and this is going to be my viola short. This is going to be cello long, and that's going to be cello short. And one last one to do, we're going to call these long and short, just to vary it up a bit, because we haven't done that before. Okay, then what I want to do is to take all of the shorts, long, dear oh dear. There we are, I'm gonna take all of the shorts, which are these tracks here, and I'm selecting these by holding my um, thumb, weirdly, but my finger here down on the command button just to select the tracks that I want. And then what I can do is to pull all these down to the bottom and it will pull the shorts to the bottom and leave the longs where they are. Okay, so with my long strings, I'm going to create a track stack. And that's again, of course, gonna be exactly the same as it was for the keys. That's gonna route all of these sounds through. They're all going to be going to bus number two. So these are gonna be my strings longs. And then what I'm going to do is to do the same thing with the strings shorts. So what we've got here now is two additional stacks, one for strings longs and one for strings shorts. Now at this stage, what I also might wanna start thinking about is the fact that if I close this down, all of these stacks look exactly the same. Yes, one's called keys and one's called strings longs and one's called strings shorts, but otherwise the same icon is being used and they're the same color. And I would definitely say that over the number of tracks that are likely to be folded down into your orchestral template, it might be worth thinking about at this stage. So what I'm also gonna do is to open up the mixer which of course, remember, is always gonna be a reflection of whatever you have got going on in the main page. In other words, if I open up the key stem, the mix is gonna get bigger to show me those tracks. If I open up the longs, strings longs, then the same thing is going to be true. So what I have a chance to do here is to select the instruments that I want to select and then think a little bit about colors. So for instance, if what I wanted to do here was to select these pianos, and what I wanted to do was to then think about their color. I can select all four of those tracks. I'm gonna make the pianos a brown color and I might decide to make their track stack the same color as well so that effectively they appear as brown tracks in the um, template that I'm working on. I could then come to the strings and select both the track stack channel and the long strings which are here and I could make those, let's say, dark green. 
And then what I could do, oh, I've missed one out, you see? It's easily done. I'm gonna select them both and make sure I'm just choosing the same color. And then what I'm gonna do is to do the same things with the string shorts. Now, I talked a little while ago about the value of creating a duplicate track within the stack that you're working on for every instrument. So we did that with the keys, but we haven't done it for the strings and uh, we haven't done it for the strings longs or for the string shorts. Now, what I'm gonna do is to come back into here and what we're gonna do is to see the value of why a duplicate track is a good idea. Let's suppose what I want to do is to create a new instrument, which I want to put into the strings longs stack. So maybe what I've done is to uh, work with the same set of sounds that I like to work with when I'm working with long string samples, but suddenly there's another new sound that I want to bring into that particular stack. Straight away, I can see that the double basses uh, track here that I've currently got selected is being routed to bus number two because that is the summing stack for the strings longs. So let's suppose I want to create a new string part to go into the strings longs folder. Okay, well, it's easy enough for me to just create a new track and to call this uh, strings longs new. But the only problem is that it's being routed to the stereo output and it's not in that stack. So in other words, it doesn't have the same routing to bus two and it doesn't exist within that stack. Now then, let's suppose for a moment, let's just throw that track away altogether. Let's suppose instead what I do is to duplicate this track instead of create a new one. Well, by duplicating it, suddenly I've got exactly the same routing, which means that straight away this sound belongs with the other ones. The only problem is that I don't really want it to be called double basses long. What I want it to do is to be a kind of empty track ready to be assigned to whatever instrument I like. So it's a good idea to have a track at the bottom of your track stack in every single one of your stacks called duplicate, ready to be brought into your project and made part of your overall template. So what we're gonna do is to close down the longs and what we'll do here is to come to the last of our shorts and we're gonna duplicate that as well. And then we're gonna be in good shape. I'm gonna just call this uh, strings, shorts, duplicate. And for the first time today, I've spelt it correctly. Okay, so what I'm going to do now, while you're trying desperately to stay awake, is I'm going to invite you to come back in, probably for me, 10 minutes, and for you, five seconds, and suddenly there'll be a bit more of a template to look at. See you in a moment. Okay, so welcome back. Just a few seconds later for you, but as you can see, I've been working hard expanding this template. Okay, so when you left a moment ago, we had some keys and we had some strings longs and some string shorts. And what I've done is to add stacks for a number of different instrument categories. And of course, I can add as many of these as I like, depending on the instruments that I like to write for. So within the woodwind stack, I've got tracks for piccolos, flutes, oboes, clarinets, bassoons, and a winds duplicate part so that again, because this is rooted through into the stack for the winds, it means that I can just duplicate that track and effectively uh, we're in good shape. And that's gonna become even more useful in a little while. We'll see why in due course. So I've then got brass and I've got percussion high and percussion mid and percussion low. Now it's worth remembering synth pads as well and synth pulses and synth basses or just basses of any description. And I could keep going, I could add instruments. Whatever it is that I like to write for, I can add to this project. So I'm gonna stop there from an instrument category point of view, but I'm gonna remind you that so far, we haven't assigned a single instrument track to any of those tracks. So they are called what they're called, but none of them are actually playing any instruments at all yet. That can all happen later. Okay, so that deals with the idea that I've got now instrument tracks assigned into instrument subgroups. And that's obviously gonna be really helpful to me when it comes to the writing and certainly when it comes to stemming or printing individual parts from my projects. But now what about effects? Well, we're gonna to come to those in just one moment, but it's worth absolutely stating that anything that relates to your logic project will be saved as part of your template every last thing. So if I save this right now, when I opened up a new track based on this template, it would be the woodwind stack that would be highlighted because it just so happens that was the last thing that I clicked. Okay, well that's fine, except that if what I really want to do is to play keyboard instruments every time I set up a new 
track, then it's in my interest that the woodwinds aren't highlighted. It might sound like a small thing, but if the first thing you have to do every day is to click away from the woodwinds, it's going to irritate you. And similarly, I wouldn't want to work with this heads up display up at the top. I'd want the full custom, I want all the information available to me. So I'm just going to fix that right now. And also, I don't like the grid lines. Controversial thing to say, a Marmite thing for me to say. Some people love the grid lines. Ah, breathe the air. No prison anymore. Okay, so again, if I take them out, they're not going to be part of my template. Up to you, you can do whatever you like. But that's better. Discuss. Okay, now, what do I mean by the idea of making sure that I'm ready to go with whatever it is that I want to do within my project. Well, I'll show you. What I'm actually going to do is to set up a brand new audio track, if you can believe it. I'm going to turn off its input routing so that there's no input assigned to it. And I'm going to put that right up at the top of my project. And I'm going to call this empty. And I'm going to keep that track highlighted so that when I come to my project, I'm starting with an empty track. And again, we're going to see why that's an advantage in a little while. Okay, so that's just been added right up at the top of the project. Now then, if it also just so happens that when I like to write for piano, I like to run that piano through one or two or three possible reverbs and maybe a bit of delay, then again, every time I have to set those effects up, I'm wasting time. If they're part of my template, I'm not wasting time. So what we're going to do now is we're going to switch into mixer mode and I'm going to select the four tracks that I've allocated to the piano, including the duplicate. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up some effect sends for the piano parts. Now, this is really important. Whenever we're just writing in Logic, I might set up, and in fact, I regularly do on this channel, I might throw some sounds together and then what I might do is to send the beat loop and the piano and the vocal to the same plate reverb. Okay, in a way it doesn't really matter, except when I come to print stems for my project, it does matter. I've got a shared reverb which is being accessed by three different instrument groups. In that example, vocals, drums, and whatever other instrument I said, keys possibly. Anyway, effectively I've got one reverb which is being fed from three different sound sources. When it comes to orchestral work, it's much better for me to be able to print a string reverb or a brass reverb or a high percussion reverb rather than a reverb that's shared across all of those instrument groups. So what I want is effects sends per stem. So in other words, sends from each of the instruments within a track stack to its own discrete separate group of auxiliaries. I'm going to show you what I mean. So I've selected these four tracks, not the track stack, the actual tracks within that stack, which are all being sent to bus number one. Now, what I want to do is I'm going to create a new auxiliary send for these effects. Now then, I need to be a little bit careful. Remember, every time I create a track stack for my template, Logic picks the next available bus number, which is great. It's a good idea. So effectively, if I was to create another new instrument stack, it would be automatically assigned to bus number 12. So if what I do now is to make the mistake of choosing bus 12 as the effect send for the keyboard's first effect, it means that if I suddenly add a new set of sends later for a new instrument track stack, they're not going to be bus 12, they're going to be bus 19 or bus 32 or whichever one is next available. I want to leave this group of buses up to number 32, let's say, for any instrument groups I want to put together. Okay? I don't want them to be effects. I want them to be track stacks for instruments. So I'm going to not select the next available bus. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come to the safety of bus numbers that are well into the higher numbers, leaving a, uh, loads and loads of potential buses as tracks um, for track stacks instead. So I'm going to select bus number 65 just an arbitrary number, but that's where I'm starting my effects routing. And because I selected all four tracks, 
Bus number 65 is assigned to all four of these pianos. Okay, well, it should be easier the next time. I'm going to come into here again. This time I'm going to select bus number um, 66. And what I'm going to do is to create four buses of sends from the pianos. Now, I can create as many of these as Logic will let me assign. And effectively, it doesn't matter how many I use. In fact, let's be generous and create five. It doesn't matter how many I use so long as I've got enough. I don't want to be in a position where I suddenly want another auxiliary and it's not the next sequential one. It's neater and tidier to have these be sequential. So buses 65 through to 69 are going to be effect sends for the pianos within my keys stem. Okay, you with me? Right, now as we can see over here, because Logic has set up these new auxiliaries, they appear over here on the left-hand side. Don't be confused. This is the 12th auxiliary that I've set up, but it's actually bus 65. Doesn't matter what the numbering is at the bottom, I can see 65 is here because that is the send from this particular track. So I'm gonna call this keys reverb one. With the next one, I'm gonna call it keys reverb. You're all shouting at the YouTube now, aren't you? That's right, two. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to make a third reverb here because sometimes it's nice to work with three reverbs. Multiple reverbs on the same project. We should make a video about that. Okay, I'm then going to say keys delay. And then I'm going to put keys FX5. I don't know what that's going to be. It might be a bit crusher. It might be, well, anyway, it could be anything. But I've now got five tracks, all of which are effects for the keyboards, only the keyboards. So in other words, if I decide that I want to write for piano number three and I want to send it to reverb number three, that would be my dial. And that would feed into this effect right here from that track and so on and so forth. I'm going to turn that back down. Otherwise, if I save it, it's going to be open every time I open up this template. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. The only thing is, if I go and repeat that process now for all of the other stems, all of these auxiliaries, and by the time we're done with all of these instrument categories, I'm going to have tens of them are going to be over here outside of the track stacks. Again, let's just close down the keys and you'll see what I mean. Within my mixer, I've got my empty first track. I've then got the track stacks for all of the instruments that I want to use. And then I've got these slightly annoyingly displaced auxiliary sends. It would be much better if these were allocated into the keyboard stem. They are effects that affect the keyboard stem. They're for the keyboard stem. So let's make them part of the keyboard stem. Okay, what I'm gonna do is to come back to the keys for a moment. I'm gonna open it back up. And what I want to do is I'm going to make a track for all of these auxiliaries. I'm gonna select all five of them. And what I'm gonna do is to hit control and I'm gonna create a track. And what that's going to do is to make all of those effect stems visible within the main page of Logic. Suddenly now I've got an opportunity to control the reverb level for this first keyboard part within my project. Well, that's great, isn't it? Because if I suddenly decide I need to be automating this track or I need to be just simply turning down the volume of this first reverb, it's all part of my project. But it's not yet part of the keyboard stack because by simply creating that track, this is still being sent to the stereo output, which means it's not part of this particular track stack. So what I'm gonna do instead is to select all five of these again, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move them up into the keyboard stack, and straight away what's gonna happen is they're all now going to be assigned to bus number one, which is the keyboards. So now, if I decide that I want to send piano one into reverb one, both of those are being routed through to the keyboard stack, which means that if I was to create a print of whatever I write for the keyboards, it will include the keyboard parts themselves and the keyboard effects all folded down into one thing. And if I wanted to create a version without the effects, all I've got to do is to mute the effects channels. Are you with me? Making sense? So now what we've done is we've created those tracks and they've become part of this track stack. And there they are. Now you might be thinking, yeah, but I'd rather have the instruments at the top rather than the effects. Well, okay, what we can do is we can select those four and we can move them up to the top and they're still all gonna be assigned into this stack. It's just that now the effects are underneath. 
Depends how you like to work. Now, if you're a total nerd like me, you might also be thinking, yeah, but I'm not gonna need these to be visible all of the time. I just want them to be visible when I want them to be visible, right? And at the moment, every time I open up the keyboards, then I can see them. There they are all of the time taking up space on my computer. And actually, whilst I'm being a little bit facetious about this, great word. Actually, there's an interesting thing about the word facetious. No, this isn't the time for it. Okay, whilst, these are here taking up space. If I was working on a laptop, actually, this would be a big deal. Suddenly I've got five tracks taking up space, which I don't need. So the next thing we need to do within our template is to configure some track headers. In other words, some components that exist for each individual track. Now at the moment, I've got some of those already. I've got a volume slider, I've got a pan dial, and I've got mute and solo, but there are others that are available to me as well, and a couple of them are gonna be useful here. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to control click, and that brings up this useful little drop-down menu, including track header components. And there are a couple of things here that I particularly want. And the main one I want is on off. And what that does is it gives me a power button for every single track. And that's going to be useful for reasons that we'll see in a moment. Now, there is another component that I want to be able to add to these tracks, but it's not actually within that same drop-down menu. I'm gonna press Control again, which brings up this main menu, and what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to hide the selected track. Now, what that's gonna allow me to do is to temporarily make these tracks invisible. I can make them come back anytime I like, but I've got an opportunity to show or hide these tracks. Well, if I'm gonna do this, let's do it for all of these effects at once. So I'm gonna select all of them, I'm going to come back to my drop-down menu, and what I want to do is to hide the selected tracks. And they've gone. Where have they gone? Well, they're visible to us again if we toggle the hide button up at the top. So effectively, what I can do is I can decide whether or not I want to make these visible all of the time, and you might, or I can temporarily hide them, which means that in order to get them back so that I can automate them or do interesting things to them, I just need to press the H button. Okay, so what we've done there is we've created a set of auxiliaries for each stack. We've made them part of the track stack and we've configured a few components which allows me now to have those effects feel like they're part of the stack. And you're already thinking, yeah, but I need to watch that again. Well, I'm gonna save you the trouble. Let's do the same thing now for the strings. Again, I promise we'll just do one more and then I'll configure the rest while you can go and make a cup of tea. So what I'm gonna do is to again open up my mixer. I'm gonna select my string longs tracks. I'm gonna open up the mixer and this time what I'm gonna do is to set up five new auxiliaries. I seem to remember I was working in the 65s. Um, and uh, what I'm gonna do now is to select the next available bus. Now, really in a very cool way, because I have made the effects that I set up for the keyboard parts now part of the keyboard stack, I can now see that there is a subgroup of effects called keys, which contains buses 65 through to 69. That's neat, isn't it? So I can see straight away that those effects are being assigned into the keyboard stack. Great. So I know that the next available one is bus 70. Then what I'm going to do is to set up bus number 71. and so on and so forth. Let's just have a little moment of quiet. Ah, you see, that's what happens when we have a moment of quiet is that I deselect some tracks. Must keep talking. Okay, there we are. So we've now got five auxiliary sends for the long strings as well. Okay, so we're gonna repeat our processes. We know that, what that means is, we've got some new auxiliaries. We need to name them. So this is gonna be strings, longs, reverb, one. Okay, well that's a lot for me to have to type each time, which means that I'm gonna select all of that, and I'm gonna copy it, and I'm then going to double click here, and that means that I can make that number two, and I can make that number three, and that's gonna be strings, longs, delay. Yeah, we might want some delay. And that is gonna be strings, longs, effects, five. Now then, the only problem is that there's enough text here that I can't really see what that says. And another thing that we can do is we can configure track components 
in the mixer as well. And one thing I think I can do is to click, sure enough, control click here, and I'm gonna to come to the channel strip components. And I think what I have a chance to do, or maybe it's in configure channel strip components. Yes, it's in configure channel strip components. I have a chance to decide how many lines of text I want for the track names. And if I take that from one to two, suddenly I can see the names of those tracks. You're welcome. Okay, so what we've got now is we've got our effects, just like we had before. And we know that what we want to do next is to create tracks for them so that they appear within Logic. So there they are. We now know that they, um, in fact, these ones, interestingly, because I selected the track stack, that was the track I had selected, they've auto added to the strings longs stack. But if they hadn't done that, all I would have to do would be to select these five and drag them into that stack, which is what we did before. And remember, if you end up doing that so that they arrive up at the top and you want to reorder them, that's fine. You can just select um, either tracks of instruments or effects, and that's absolutely fine. These are now configured into the right bus, bus number two. And then what I can do again, once again, is to select all five, control click, and what I can do is to hide the selected tracks. And once again, they will vanish. Now, what that means is that if I was to open up the keys and the strings, which we can see side by side, and I was to press the hide button, we'd get the effects back for the keyboards and the effects back for the strings. And like I say, the huge advantage of that is that if you want to automate them, then effectively those tracks are available. But if you just need them to be effect sends, you can just come back into hide mode again and you're back where you started. Okay, so the next obvious thing for me to do would be to go through and create effect sends for all of the remaining groups. But I think you understand now how that's done. Remember, select the next available auxiliary from these lower numbers. We started at bus number 65. Create them up to five per instrument within each stem. And then what you're going to do is to assign them into their track stacks. Okay, now the configure um, track header button that we created, which allowed us to have a power light, literally an on off switch for each individual track is useful. And the reason for that is that Logic will only power up an instrument. It will only enable it when it's switched on. Now, automatically that happens by default if you don't configure that individual track. So let's suppose for a moment that what I went through and did now was to assign my three pianos. And let's suppose I was calling those out from contact instruments, for instance. Well, contact would have to load and it would have to load that sound. And it would load all three of those pianos because they would all be on. And then I'd come into my strings longs and maybe I'm using Spitfire audio samples for those, or maybe I'm using Vienna Symphonic Library, or maybe I'm using cinematic um, samples, whatever, whoever has made them, cine samples maybe. Now, it could be that I want to use my template to write a piece for piano and pizzicato violas and a bassoon. Three instruments. I don't want all of the other instruments to load. I don't need them. I only want them to load when I need them. In other words, if I decide to add a second piano, that's when I need the second piano. If I decide I need cellos, that's when I need cellos. So the great thing about these power buttons is that effectively what they allow me to do is to deselect any instrument until I decide that I need to switch it on. Now I'm gonna leave the stacks turned on, that's fine. But all of the instruments, um, the actual instruments within each stack can be switched off so that they don't auto load. So I can go through each individual stack and I can turn off the power buttons for the actual tracks themselves so that they're not on until I need them. And in fact, if I just turn off the power for each individual stem, it will turn off the power for the instruments within the stem. And that means that so long as I select my empty track as the first track, so in other words, when I save my template, if I have the empty track up at the top, there's nothing to load on that track. Now, the huge advantage of that is that it means that your template will load in seconds. All of the instruments will be fired up, ready to go for you, but it will load in seconds. Now, yes, every time you click on a track and you enable it, it will take a moment to load that one instrument, but that's still better than it loading, well, we're already up to 69 tracks, and that's just using, in fact, 73, and that's just using the track stacks that I've created. So I would strongly advise that you create an audio track, which you call empty, and you put it up at the top, and you make it the track that you've clicked on, 
so that if, when you fire up your template, nothing else is loaded and ready to go. Now then, the one thing we're not going to do on this video, because all of us are going to be using different sounds, is to actually allocate the instruments we might want for each one. But that would be the thing to do next. So if you're somebody who wants to work with Spitfire audio samples and you like to use those sounds and you have them available, then yes, the next thing to do would be to allocate that particular instrument into this slot. And not only that, but also to make sure that the articulation that you like to use is pre-selected. And the advantage of that is it means that if I click on that track now, it will load it and it will be ready to go. And in fact, I could go further. If what I wanted to do was to make sure that not only were the sounds set up ready for me to work with, but so were the articulation sets so that the actual articulations that I wanted to work with were also allocated on each individual track, well, they're available to me now as well because we've made those articulation sets already. Do go and watch the articulation mapping video. So templates can go as deep as you want. Every single track can be set up however you like. You can set up as many instruments as in advance as you like, or you can just go for this kind of wireframe that I have, which is that I've labeled the tracks without actually allocating instruments to them. And yeah, for sure, in my orchestral template, I've set up the instruments that I like to work with so that they're all ready to go. But all of the power lights are off so that I have to turn them on, which means that each one loads only when I need it. There's just one more thing to say, which is I would definitely recommend that you leave some headroom on the individual tracks within your mix. So in other words, I'm gonna to come to the pianos and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set all of the faders at minus five. And I would do the same thing for every single instrument group so that all of these sounds individually are set up with plenty of headroom. I don't wanna be getting to a point where I'm overloading the output after just adding a few instruments. So by putting in some headroom all the way through for all of these instruments, including these ones that we haven't assigned yet with their effects or anything else, I would just leave five dB of headroom and I just go through and do that. It's always easy to make things louder. It's much harder to make things quieter if suddenly you find that you're overloading the output. So exactly what is the difference then between a project and a template? After all, everything we've done so far, effectively I could set up for use within this particular project that I wanna work on. But of course, the whole point of a template is that I don't want to have to do all of this every single time I want to write for this group of instruments. So of course, the next and final thing that we really need to do is to make sure that we're saving this project as a template so it can act as the kind of starting point for all of the actual music writing we want to do. Now remember, I've said this a few times, but I'm gonna say it one more time, every last decision that I make Every last detail that goes into my template will be saved as part of that template. So what I need to do is to make sure that I've closed up my track stacks. I'm gonna make sure that I've done that for every single one of them. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna specify my empty track up at the top as the track that I've clicked on, which means that when I open up my template, that's where my, um, my track is gonna be selected. The other thing to say just before we close this down is if you don't write at 120 beats per minute every day, why would you decide that that you was gonna be your sort of starting tempo? There's obviously Logic's default starting tempo, and it's probably true that you write a different tempi for the projects that you're working on. But actually, if you're the sort of person who prefers to write around the 100 BPM mark, why not make that part of your template as well? Another detail you might want to think about. Okay, so to save as a template, very straightforward. I come to File, and what I do is simply to save this as a template. And there is a space called Project Templates, including the one that we made in the previous video, and I can call this whatever I like. So I might decide to call this Orchestral Full. Let's say this is my full template for my orchestral work, and then what I can do is just simply press Save. And what's gonna happen is that rather than saving this as a regular track, effectively what happens is immediately this project is available to me as a template and look what's happened to the title. Effectively what I've got is an untitled project start that I can start from scratch. So if I wanted to start a brand new project, all I've got to do is to come to file and then what I can do is to come down to um, new from template. And what this allows me to do Obviously, I'm going to close my current project, so I'm going to just close that down. And then what I've got a chance to do is to dive straight into the templates area. Now, there are project templates that Logic has made, Apple have made for you. Your project is going to be in my templates, and here is my orchestral full. And when I click on this, 
here it is, and I'm ready to go. Now, look how quickly this project opened. Because none of the instruments are live, admittedly, I've only set one up, but the one that I've got open is that rather than spending a few seconds waiting for the BBC um, SO plugin to load, it hasn't had to do that because I haven't selected that track. So straight away, my project is open, ready for me to select the tracks that I want. And of course, the really important point is I can make as many templates as I like. So this is my orchestral full, but I can make an extension of this if I want to make fuller, hmm, there's a thought. Or of course, I can make any other number of templates for the various types of work that I want to do. If I was writing orchestral, uh, sorry, if I was writing electronic dance music, I don't need half of these instrument categories. So a separate template for that kind of uh, musical approach would be wise. So within this video, we've looked at loads of information. You might want to watch it again with a new cup of tea. Um, but nevertheless, hopefully what you've now got is quite a lot of information to help you set up the project templates that you need for orchestral writing.